Happy Valentine's Day and welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and you know I love making holiday kill counts, so today I'm looking at Valentine, a pretty straightforward slasher released in 2001. This movie's a little weird to me. Many of its very negative reviews called it a throwback to 80s slashers, but to me, it still seems like a scream-inspired whodunit. Directed by Australian filmmaker Jamie Blanks, who also made the much more obvious Scream-inspired urban legend in 1998, Valentine features a cast of attractive and decently known young stars, a masked mystery killer with plenty of potential culprits, and kills that, while plentiful, tend to avoid any extreme gore. That all feels pretty screamy to me, and the only thing here that really reminds me of 80s slashers is the fact that all of the characters are pretty boring and make stupid decisions that end up getting them killed. Let's see how many crappy characters get their bleeding hearts ripped out. Cause it's time for the kills! Slash entire movie summary. The movie begins with a yearbook from a San Francisco middle school. Let's see who signed it. Oh, a, uh, a crazy person. Cool. These scary red pen scribblings were done by school nerd Jeremy Melton, who, in 1988, was rejected at a dance by all of the girls he tried talking to, including an amazingly cast actor playing a young version of Denise Richards. In a scene with some seriously nauseating heartbeat editing, we watch as Jeremy gets shot down by girl after girl. One potential dance partner Kate is nicer than her friends and tells Jeremy maybe later. But it's not until he talks to the quote unquote fat girl Dorothy that he ends up spit swapping beneath the bleachers. Everyone can see you too. A bunch of adolescent douche nozzles find them and start their shameless bullying, which causes Dorothy to lie and say that Jeremy Melton assaulted her. Pervert. The wrongfully accused boy gets pig's bl er, punch dumped onto him, and after his nose starts a bleeding, he's pantsed and abused by the bullies while the whole student body watches and laughs. God damn, kids can be evil. I'm sorry, this is rough to watch. Could we please cut away to a title card? Thank you. 13 years later, one of the girls who rejected Jeremy, Shelly Fisher, is all grown up and played by Katherine Heigl, who just a few years prior was that insufferable character in Bride of Chucky. She's on a date with an asshole named Jason, who talks about himself in the third person and says he wants to breed with her. Check, please. Sorry, dude. Guess he can't just skate by on dates looking like hot Chris Kattan. Shelly's a med student at UCLA, where she studies dead bodies in the morgue. But don't get too excited, y'all. Cadavers don't go on the kill count. They died prior to the movie, and, you know, they aren't really characters. Shelly hears a loud crash, and as we, the audience, remember that she was credited as Anne Catherine Heigl, it becomes apparent real quickly that this girl about to get Drew Barrymore. She finds a Valentine address to her with a fun little pool tab pick inside. That's nice. That's nice. Hey, that's what I said. When she returns to her workstation, she finds her cadaver breathing. Cause, wait a minute, her cadaver is now in this closet back here. Meaning she just nearly cut into a g -g 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 ghost Nah, just kidding. She nearly just cut into this dude who attacks her now from behind a curtain. This is the stupidest fucking thing though, man. You're telling me the killer came in, moved her cadaver, took his own shirt off, got under a sheet, and nearly allowed himself to get sliced open just for, what, shits and gigs? Please don't be Scream 3, Valentine. This movie's killer wears a cherub mask designed by K&B FX Group. It's not a bad mask, but it was way too expensive for me to buy for the background of this video. But hey, if you're a huge Valentine fan, the link's in this video description. Have at it. He chases Shelly down a hallway and into a room full of body bags. Pretty fortuitous for her, since the body bag works as the perfect hiding place. Er, actually, never mind. This is not good. The killer checks each corpse with his knife in a decently directed slasher set piece, the first of a handful in this film. Eventually, though, he does find Shelly and slits her throat to make her the first victim on our count, as her blood empties out into the drip tray. Looks like this mofo gives blood to get blood too, since he bleeds out through his nose hole in the mask. Run there! With the opening kill out of the way, Valentine briefly becomes a bad romantic comedy, also known as most romantic comedies, as we head back to San Francisco to join Paige, played by Denise Richards, and Kate, the girl who was somewhat nice to Jeremy as a kid. Kate is played by Marley Shelton, who would go on to be that red herring deputy in Scream 4 nearly a 
decade later. The two of them make sexist short jokes about guys. Painfuls meeting someone on the internet and finding out that six footish really Five, means Five, four with loafers, I know. And go on a speed dating session chock full of broad comedy and unlikable caricatures. The Bible is the foundation of morality and marriage. I'm glad they're having a good time here, but I'm already pissed that these are the vapid characters we're stuck watching in this movie. The two of them get a phone call about Paige's death, and at her funeral, Kate rejects a rekindling with her recent ex-boyfriend Adam, played by David Boreanis. At this time in his career, in this type of movie, localized entirely within this cemetery, Adam's got a drinking problem, which is why he and Kate are broken up right now. Now, although he swears to her he's been clean for a few weeks now. After he leaves, the ladies meet up with their other friends. Dorothy, the one who had falsely accused Jeremy Melton as a child, and Lily, the, uh, other mean blonde one. Jesus, Paige, it's a funeral. What? It's cool that this movie follows a group of gal pals who seem like good friends. I just wish their characters were more memorable and, you know, likable. They're questioned by a cop named Detective Vaughn who's investigating Shelly's death, but they tell him that they haven't seen her for a year or more. He thanks them for their information and leaves, but not before blatantly eye-fucking Paige in public. Dorothy heads home to her mansion, cause she's rich, and finds a pool tab valentine addressed to her, just like Shelly had received. Only this one is signed with a JM, hmm. Before she can figure out what that means, she gets a visit from her boyfriend of one whole month, Campbell, who just lost his apartment after his roommate didn't pay the rent. And of course the timing couldn't be worse because every penny I have is invested in this startup. Oh god, I bet he refers to himself as an entrepreneur, huh? Blech. Dorothy decides to let him move into one of their guest rooms, an insane decision that even housekeeper Millie knows is fucking whack. Meanwhile, Kate, who does not live in a mansion, experiences some water stoppage in the middle of washing her hair, forcing her to give herself a swirly to finish the job. Fun fact, I also gave myself a swirly in a video I made and put online in 2003. Man, I was a fucking idiot. Kate gets a spooky phone call and sees that her apartment door is now open, but her walk out into the hallway still just in a towel. Yeah, that's a great idea, Kate. She finds the elevator door stuck open with a cherub mask blocking its path. The same cherub mask some kids wore back at their middle school dance. Kate picks up the mask, only to be scared by her annoying neighbor Gary, a poor man's Cosmo Kramer, whose character consists entirely of hitting on her in rhyme. How about a date, Kate? Can be my mate, Kate. The last two ladies of this friend group, Paige and Lily, will get their own Valentine experience just as soon as they're done making more shitty short jokes. There's nobody there. Probably just Lance, he doesn't clear the people, remember? There's shit talking this dude who sent Lily a video date, and yes, that used to be a thing. There's some great collections of real ones online. Uh, kind of your typical research mathematician, I guess. And you thought dating apps were bad. Anyway, Lily gets a valentine from JM alongside some chocolates with a special filling inside. Maggots! Are you sure those weren't sent from the Tans Dance Academy? As they suss out who JM could be, they think of Jeremy Melton, giving them the perfect opportunity to make nerd jokes. But Pete, you look so pretty, Pete. Since miserably annoying people like to keep company with each other, the girls go to an art exhibit Exhibit, where they see that Jason guy from Shelly's date staring at them with all the subtlety of a Purge movie. Spoiler alert, we'll never see this dude again, but I do hope y'all like your herrings red. Lily introduces Paige and Kate to her boyfriend Max, the artist of this exhibit, who, just like that cop, loves to engage in eye fucking. Hello, Kate. Max gives some fart-huffing presentation before sending his audience off on a bullshit interactive experience. Actually, you know what? I shouldn't talk too much shit about this scene. It's probably the most interesting set piece of the movie. Love me. Love me. Love me. And hell yeah, dude, it's got Deftones playing in the background. During the exhibit, Lily gets mad when Max tries to rope her into a threesome, leading her to storm away from him with an exchange that actually made me laugh aloud. Well, the problem is you turned out to be a cheap, hypocritical sleazeball. Yeah, 
but you knew that. Lily gets lost among the sexy sliding doors and giant pics of T posing before she's suddenly shot in the stomach with an arrow. <laughs> Why's that dude's head look so tiny? The killer shoots her again, knocking her outside, and as his nose bleeds, he lines up a third and final shot that sends her over a balcony and straight down into a dumpster. Jason takes Manhattan style. That's how you kill and clean up all in one action, bitches. Under the watchful eye of this art exhibit, Dorothy's boy toy Campbell gets yelled at by a woman named Ruthie. Better see why this lady's so upset, Dorthster. I'm just the idiot who's still waiting for the return on her internet investment. Oh, I see. You gotta be careful with them internet investments. Campbell drags Dorothy away, and now it's the next day, where the girls are once again being questioned by Detective Vaughn. They tell this bargain bin Ed Harris that it might be Jeremy Melton who killed Shelly, since back in sixth grade, they got him sent to reform school after he attacked Dorothy. He did attack you. Right? No. Dorothy, you asshole! I was fat. That's not an excuse! And no, you aren't! Vaughn researches Jeremy Melton and discovers that he went to a state-run mental hospital before disappearing off the grid a few years back. Although this 2001 Animorphs technology shows them what Jeremy may look like now... But know anybody that looks like this? Or this? Or this. Vaughn notes that it's possible he could look completely different too, since he may have gotten plastic surgery, even though that is not how plastic surgery works. I guess this movie's pretty Scream 3 though. Further questioning leads some of the ladies to suspect Dorothy's new boyfriend Campbell as the killer, before they all leave the station to go back home. Except for Paige, who Vaughn holds back to openly harass in his office. Please remove your hand from my thigh. Gotta love movies where everybody sucks. At Kate's apartment, her for some reason running iron is picked up by the Cupid killer as he finds Scary Gary sitting in her room and trying on her underpants. Although Gary says, I'm not sick and I'm not well, the killer makes him sit a down with a blow to the head that proceeds to kill him with the running iron. First by burning his face and then by straight beating him to death and nothing of value was lost. Kate returns home to find Adam waiting to give her a Valentine's gift. <gasps> a whole goddamn sucker you shouldn't have! They've actually had some scenes throughout the movie showing them slowly getting back together, but I haven't felt the need to mention any of them because they're all pretty much boring as fuck. Speaking of boring relationships, Dorothy still has Campbell hanging around her mansion, and the two of them also exchange Valentine's gifts. She gets him an expensive watch, and he gets her this. Wow. It's so beautiful. Damn, Dorothy. I guess all that money can't buy you better lying skills. Campbell turns out to be the con man you'd expect him to be, having forged this relationship with Dorothy in order to steal funds from her family's account. Sounds like he needs a good justice murder. Right after he fixes the blown out pilot light in this water heater. The killer appears behind Campbell and swings an axe into his back, and that one strike was enough to kill him. I guess Warner Brothers made the movie cut down on its gore thanks to concerns about violence after Columbine, which, come to think of it, was also a problem for Scream 3. Maybe that's why these movies are so similarly stupid. A party gets bumping at Dorothy's mansion, but she has a hard time enjoying it since she thinks Campbell has stood her up. It doesn't help when that Ruthie chick shows up and says that Dorothy is wearing her neck Necklace. Maybe let Dorothy keep it though, Ruthie. It's not a nice necklace. Still, all things considered, I think that seems like a pretty nice party. Nice party, Dorothy. It blows. This party sucks. This party officially sucks. Oh well, fuck me, I guess. Ruthie goes to leave the party, only to run into the killer, dragging housekeeper Millie's body out of a closet. Man, you're supposed to hide bodies in the closet. Why are you acting in reverse, dude? Another slasher set piece ensues, during which Ruthie finds Campbell's corpse in the, uh, sauna, I think? But eventually, the killer throws Ruthie through a glass shower door, leaving one dangerous-looking shard behind. The cherub-faced killer murders Ruthie by jamming her head through it chin first. Hot damn! Kate finds Adam drinking some champagne and gets mad at him for falling off the wagon. 
You know, I've been looking all over for you. And I wasn't at the bottom of the bottle. She leaves him without sympathy as some orgy blares over the speakers. But it's not a song from Candy Ass, so I'm not too familiar with it. Paige winds up in a hot tub so we can have the requisite Denise Richards bikini clad scene. And hey, who'd have guessed it? The killer shows up to ruin her relaxing soap. After hearing a noise, Paige looks around only to be thrown back into the jacuzzi, which the killer locks her inside of by closing the lid up tight. Quiet down with all that ruckus, Paige. You know how loud noises gives this guy bloody noses. The killer drills some holes into the cover and Paige's body, and when the water's good and ready, he tosses the power drill inside to cause a death by electrocution. Buzzy buzzy! The kill causes the mansion's power to go out, which sends most of the party guests headed home. Wow, that little bridge driveway sucks. You'd have to drive so slow! Dorothy, who's upset about, you know, everything, yells at Kate that Adam is responsible for everything going on, and that he's probably Jeremy Melton, all buffed up in plastic surgery. That still doesn't make any goddamn sense, but at least it gives Kate a chance to make a slick reference to Boreanaz's prior work. Okay, fine, he's no angel, but he's not a murderer. Nicely done. Instead of just, I don't know, leaving the murder mansion, Kate calls Detective Vaughn for help, only to hear his phone ringing from somewhere in the backyard. Sounds like it's near this little pond guy here. Is that thing for koi fish, or? <laughs> nope, just heads, severed heads. Quick, Kate, run and get some help before the koi fish gets sick. She runs back inside the mansion, where Adam descends the stairs like a creeper and scares her straight into a slow dance. I'm just worried that she'll hurt me. Instead, she hurts him with a knee to the nuts and tries to run away. He chases her into a final girl circuit, where of course she discovers dead bodies. She also fights back a bit and finds his head at the bottom of this bottle. After locating a rack of real weapons, though, Kate arms herself up with a handgun and takes it on the offensive upstairs. There, the cherub masked killer runs out at her, which causes both of them to take a nasty spill down the steps. When the figure sits up like a serial killer, they get shot all to hell in the chest, thanks to Adam in the game room with the gun. Adam hugs Cade and unmasks the killer to reveal Dorothy dead as a doornail, bleeding out all over her own expensive floor rugs. He calls the police and comforts Kate, and the two of them say that they love each other. In fact, I always have. Always, like since the sixth grade? Cause even though Kate doesn't fucking react to it at all, she gets some blood on her cheek courtesy of Adam's drippy nose. Cause the movie ends with the implication that Adam is Jeremy Melton and that he was the real killer all along. David Boreanaz is obviously not the product of face-changing plastic surgery, but he still managed to permanently break a bunch of hearts. Let's see how many and get to the numbers. Uh... The air is really dry in here. Nine people died in Valentine, and with three of them men and six of them women, we had the rare occurrence of the ladies outnumbering the guys. Two to one! With a runtime of 96 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 10 points. Six, seven minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Ruthie. It was definitely the most painful to watch, even if it wasn't overly graphic with the gore. Doll machete for lamest kill goes to Millie, whose body was dragged around the house all willy nilly. And that's it. Valentine came out in 2001 and is a great example of why the slasher boom after Scream ended so quickly. They were just getting phoned in after a while. Next week's a P.O. Box video, and after that, I'll look at scary stories to tell in the dark. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Brittany Lusk, Knightly Gaia Emo, Robert Van Geem, Louisa Jansen, Travis Payne, Jordan Fejo Shaw, and Tristan. When this video comes out, I'll be recovering from a surgery on my vocal cord. It's not a big deal, I'm just getting a polyp removed, but I'm unable to speak for the entirety of the month of February. Thanks everyone, be good people.